I'm Larry Walther. This is principlesofaccounting.com, Chapter 15. In this module, we will continue with our discussion of earnings per share and other key indicators. The previous module looked specifically at earnings per share. Now we're going to see how earnings per share can be used in other performance indicators, beginning with the price earnings ratio, which is simply the market price of a company's stock per share divided by the earnings per share. Companies will have significant differences in their price earnings ratio. Investors, or investors may be willing to pay a high multiple for a company with a bright future or maybe a low multiple for a company that's had a good history of earnings but maybe the future doesn't look so bright. Generally you try to find good value which is when you're buying stocks which is looking for low price earnings ratios but that's not always the case because again you need to consider the, his, the past as well as the, as well as the future prospects for a company and so valuing earnings is a bit tricky in that regard. Sometimes people will look at a PEG ratio, which is the price earnings ratio divided by the company's growth rates. A lower PEG ratio numbers may help identify more attractive investments. These are generalizations. Uh, every situation is unique, of course. But if a company is growing at 20% per year versus a company that's growing at 10% per year, obviously all of the things being equal, you would rather buy the investment that has the higher growth, growth rate. So this is, a, this is a, a calculation that integrates the P-E ratio with the company's growth rates. Another ratio that should be looked at is the book value per share. This is the common equity divided by the common shares outstanding at the balance sheet date. Book value is not the same as market value or fair value. Book value is based upon amounts reported in the balance sheet. Uh, many assets may be carried at historical cost and certainly there are certain things that may not appear on the balance sheet at all or certain things that appear on the balance sheet that may not be readily convertible to value such as certain intangibles, a brand name or something of that nature. For a corporation with only one class of stock, we'll say common stock outstanding, the book value per share calculation is not too difficult. It's the total stockholders equity divided by the shares outstanding at the end of the period. For example, here's a company with a book value of $24 per share. It's $12 million in equity divided by 500,000 shares. Here's their stockholders equity. Here's the $12 million of total equity divided by the 500,000 shares issued an outstanding to give us that book value per share. When we introduce preferred stock into the calculation of book value per share, we get a bit more complex scenario. We need to determine how much of the total stockholders equity is available to the preferred shares and how much remains or the residual amount that's available to the common equity. The amount attributable to the preferred stock is generally considered to be the call price of the preferred stock plus any amounts that are due for current and prior periods dividends. So let's assume that Mueller Corporation has the following equity structure. We've got preferred stock, $100 par value, callable at 110, 6% cumulative, 300,000 shares authorized, 100,000 shares issued and outstanding. So although the par value is $10 million, the call price is $11 million, 110% of the par value. So to get rid of those guys would take $11 million, Plus, we would also need to pay the dividends. The annual dividend is 6% of par, or $6 a share on 100,000 shares is $600,000. The notes to the financial statements for Mueller Corporation suggested that last year's dividend had not been paid, the current year's dividend had not been paid on the preferred stock. They're at $600,000 for two years. So we've got the $11 million call price, another $1,200,000 of dividends. Theoretically, it would take $12,200,000 to liquidate the preferred shareholders if we dispersed that amount of the 36200 total equity, dispersing $12,200,000 would leave $24 million residual equity for the common shares and we would divide that by the 600,000 common shares to come up with $40 book value per share in this particular case. The calculations are shown in the textbook. The dividend rate it's the annual cash dividend divided by the market price per share. Some companies do not pay dividends. They choose to reinvest in new money-making ventures, or, or they may not be making money at all, in which case they can't pay dividends necessarily. But dividend-paying companies are often evaluated and valued based on their dividend-paying rate. And certainly there's a certain class of investors who are very interested in that annual dividend or periodic dividend. If a company pays $1 per share each year of dividends and the stock is selling for $20 a share, we would say it has a 5% yield. 
The dividend payout rate compares the annual cash dividends to the earnings per share. It evaluates whether a company is capable of sustaining its dividend rate. For example, if a company earned $3 per share, paid out $1 in dividends on $3 in earnings, its payout rate would be 0.333. On the other hand, if earnings were only 50 cents per share, but the company continued to pay out its dollar, its payout rate would be 2. So when you would see that particular company, you'd say, well, that, there's some issue with the ability of the company to continue to pay that dividend. The dividend safety is in question. If the payout ratio is 2, you're paying out twice as much as you're earning. That's unsustainable over a long-term basis. Return on assets is net income plus interest expense divided by average assets. The ratio, the calculation of the ratio varies by analyst. You may see a little bit different twist on this in other textbooks. It assesses how effectively assets are being utilized to generate profits. Notice that it excludes financing costs and focuses on operating income, hence we're adding back the interest cost to the net income. It's often used to compare profitability and efficiency for companies in similar industries. Return on equity is the net income minus the preferred dividends divided by the average common equity, somewhat akin to that book value calculation we looked at with preferred stock. It's used to compare the effectiveness of capital utilization by different firms. However, it does not evaluate risk. A firm with a high return on equity may rely heavily on debt financing. Uh, the debt exposes the business to significant risk. So you're not always interested in a high return on equity if you're getting there at the extent of risking the business by being highly leveraged. Return on equity can be compared to the rate of interest on borrowed funds to assess how effective a company is in utilizing borrowed funds or how effective they are in utilizing their leverage. If the return on equity exceeds the cost of borrowed funds or the interest rate uh, associated with borrowed funds, you can generally conclude for that period of time that they're using their borrowed funds effectively. On the other hand, if the return on equity is less than the cost of borrowed funds, then actually that debt's helping dig a, dig a hole. We're not covering the cost of the borrowed funds operationally, and it suggests we're not being effective in utilizing borrowed funds.